Well, good morning. Welcome to worship here at Glendale Heights United Methodist Church. My name is John. I serve as the pastor here. It's good to see everybody for our um, outdoor worship. This is actually our, uh, well, we'll see. This is, <laughs> this is uh, the last outdoor worship before we decide that we're going to move inside, and then we'll see what happens after that. So uh, we won't say it's our last one outside because it's kind of nice to be outside, and we'll, we don't know what's going to happen. So... Um, but welcome to worship. Welcome to those who are watching online. Um, that is just our one announcement this week is that next week we will plan to have uh, worship in the sanctuary. So I'm excited for that. Um, you'll get an email this week about uh, sort of guidelines and suggestions for what that will look like. Um, I've already announced last week that we will wear masks and ask people to sit with their families, but then distance from everyone else. The service will be, um, it'll, it'll be modified. It will look like these services that we've been having outdoors. Um, and anything else more specific, we'll send out this, this week. Um, it is a communion Sunday, so we'll have instructions for that in that email, but we'll, we'll still use those individual cups for right now. And then uh, for folks that don't feel comfortable inside, we will um, offer sort of the drive up following the online service as well. So, um, that's our announcements this morning, uh, as long as I'm not forgetting anything. Is there any other announcements this morning? Yeah, John. <laughs> Tommy has one. So Tommy's in Graham County now. His address is on the table inside the church, so we'll, we'll try to get the um, directory updated promptly for everybody. Um, perfect. Is there anything else this week that we, um, for just announcements? So the we are actually like it didn't get any more of a center of the state than the Sunday school thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we will be about 30, 30 minutes from my grip tree. Um and my aunt is really in uh, love with this area. So we just pray for her but know that um, things are just kind of working for God's work in this area. So Yeah, so the the shortened version if uh, the online people uh We'll be in Davenport, Florida, uh, at Community of Faith United Methodist. Um, that was announced today. Um, so, yeah. Uh, now, as we begin this time of worship, I invite you to uh, prepare your hearts and minds um, and hear this prelude.
Amen. Um, so for all of our uh, call and response and singing this morning, we will remain seated, but I invite you to join me uh, for this greeting uh, and to, to say the part that's in bold. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. For the Lord is good. Amen. Let's sing our first hymn together, which is in your bulletin, For the Beauty of the Earth. are grateful for Amy but especially when uh, the winds blow in the pages and she's dodging the uh, whatever these little things are I, I said to Emily I thought these were what make pine cones and she said that's not correct does anyone know what those do new pine trees is that what you said Emily oh so we've figured out one, one of the great mysteries today. These are pollinators for new oak trees. Um, pine. <laughs> pine for the, uh, the online <laughs> mixture. Um, so we do. We, we celebrate uh, the potential of new life all around us um, <laughs> this morning. Um, any other celebrations or concerns or prayer requests uh, that we need to lift up today? Yeah, Angie. Okay. So we pray for the Browns, Kenny and Matt, who lost their, their dad this past week. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, Eddie. So we, we pray this morning for Eddie's friend, Leon, who's having uh, surgery uh, this week. Yeah, David. I am celebrating as I sit here and look at that flagpole and these azaleas and the dishes that y'all were sitting on. That was my son's super project here at the church. And I don't know that I've ever gotten to enjoy these azaleas uh, from inside the church. Yeah. Here they are blooming. <laughs> Yeah, so we, we celebrate um, just being outside, and then David specifically, his son, uh, for his Eagle Scout project, put in the benches and azaleas and did some beautification work around the church, and now we're uh, able to enjoy it because we are outside and not, not inside. So, Yeah, Glenda. So we pray for Glenda um, and, and for the Simmons for um, their upcoming uh, uh, spreading of the ashes of your friend, um, this Sylvia, this coming week. Uh, 
and we just we continue to pray for Steve uh, and for Robin um, and for Steve's daughter. At, what's your Mary. Mary for Mary? And we're glad you're with us this week. Um, for Steve to to recover and to um, to continue to heal from his surgery, but also um, just we're praying for you um, this week. So let's uh, let's pray together. Creator God, we give you thanks for um, for this day and and for uh, this space uh, to be outside to be in your creation, to hear birds singing, to see flowers blooming, uh, and even for the the pine uh, pollinators all around us that are uh, falling on some of us. We we just give you thanks for a time to be together, uh, to be um, together with one another, to be um, together worshiping you. And we give you thanks for uh, for all of the ways we've experienced uh, your love throughout this week, through all of the ways that uh, you remind us of the blessings of our lives. And God, this morning, um, we lift up all of the uh, prayer requests that, that folks shared here in this outdoor gathering, also any that have been lifted up online. Um, and God, we just we ask for folks that, uh, that are going... Uh, into surgery for for um, for successful surgeries for folks uh, who are recovering, uh, especially Steve for for healing uh, and for your uh, your hand of healing to be on Steve uh, and and to be with those who uh, journey with those who have gone through medical procedures or who are um, going through those. And God, we ask uh, especially for those who are grieving. Um, grieving and mourning the loss of, of friends and loved ones, uh, we ask for uh, your peace to surround, uh, to surround them, that they might feel the comfort of uh, the promise of eternal life that's given through your son, Jesus Christ. And God, this morning we continue to pray for our world, for our nation, for our city, for our community, as we continue through a time of a, a global pandemic, of, um, of injustice and unrest, and, and all of the situations where people are struggling, God, we ask that you would, um, you would be present in those situations, that you would meet the needs of those people, and that we as the church, as the people of God, would be called into action to to serve those and to bring your presence and love into those spaces. And so we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture for this morning comes from uh, 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 24. It says this, We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God and we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit that he has given us. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say, thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Oh God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be acceptable unto you. Oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. It says, Jesus laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. When we hear about this type of sacrifice, sometimes we think of it as the ultimate sacrifice, right? And and that brings up for us, uh, we might think of things like um, people who have given their life in military service, right? They've made the ultimate sacrifice uh, in their service to our country, to the military. They've maybe received a Medal of Honor or uh, given their life in battle to, to save their friends, really, to save their, um, the people that they're at war with. Another thing we might think about when we think of the ultimate sacrifice is the, the folks, the heroes who uh, served on 9-11, right? The people that rushed into uh, the buildings and, and went in despite um, or in spite of their own safety and, and went in for, to save lives of other people, right? The firefighters, the, the EMTs, and those folks that, that went in to save, save them. So Emily and I were talking about uh, this passage this week, and uh, she got a text from someone we know from Orlando asking for uh, some pictures, because this is going to be on June 12th, the fifth anniversary of the Pulse nightclub shooting that happened in Orlando. Um, and so we were reflecting on that, and uh, in that shooting, there was a mother there with her 21-year-old son who... Uh, gave her life for her son basically shielded him from from the bullets and she didn't survive but but he did so she laid her life down for her son and i think it's really difficult to fathom the type of sacrifice um that these kind of things military service or running into a burning building or or taking a a, a bullet for somebody um what amount of love it would take to make that kind of sacrifice. A love that springs into action with no regard for personal safety or concern for uh, your own life. Recently, we were talking with a good friend of ours uh, who, whose sister had a baby, so she has a new nephew. And, and she, on the phone, was just saying, I, I get it now. I get this love that you have for someone where you would say something like, I would, I would take a bullet for my nephew, right? And that, that's probably something that we've all considered or thought about if we would be willing to lay down our lives for somebody else. I think one of the most daunting parts of our Christian faith is that at some point we may be asked uh, to give our lives, right? That, that our faith is, uh, is one where we serve uh, a Lord or serve a Savior who, who did give his life. And so this verse says we ought to give our lives for one another. And, and although that we think about those kind of heroic or um, uh, literal 
sacrifices of laying down your life for someone. I, I think another way we can think about it is that we may be called um, to give up our lives metaphorically, right? That we may be called to, to live in a way that is sacrificial, where we give of ourselves to other people um, in an act of love um, and generosity. And so in, in 1 John chapter 3, it says we ought to lay down for our lives for one another. And, and another way we can interpret this is we ought to live in a way where we give sacrificially uh, to others, not thinking only of ourselves, but willing to give out of our love to others. Verse 16 says, we know love by this, that Jesus gave his life for us. I mean, it is, it is only through what Jesus did for us on the cross that we can know the, the fullness of God's love for each of us. And they, they say love is a, a funny thing, right? It can make us do crazy things, but, but more than doing crazy things, it, it also makes us think about other people, right? It makes us not just think about ourselves. When we love someone, we are concerned with them. We think about them. We're focused on them and not ourselves. And I think it's easier most of the time uh, to do this with your immediate circle, right? It's easiest to do this with the people you live with or the people in your family or the people who uh, maybe you've chosen to be your friends. Um, I say most of the time. Uh, but our faith is one that demands that we think about our neighbors, right? It demands that we, that we love people who we may not know very well at all, that we are just in, in a sort of proximity with. In verse 17, it asks us, How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother and sister in need and yet refuses help? We have to ask ourselves, how are we showing love to those in need? What are we doing for what the Bible describes as the least of us or the least of these, right? The poor, the naked, the hungry, the, the homeless, those who desperately need help, that are living in situations where they need something. It says that we are called to love those people as well. And it asks a tough question, how can God's love abide in us if we are able to help and we refuse to, right? I mean, that, that cuts to uh, kind of some, some core uh, places, I think, when we, when we think about what we're able to do but, but maybe don't. And then it says, how can God's love abide in people that, that have means and, and choose not to help? Verse 18 says, little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. So God's love calls us to action. Loving one another isn't about uh, necessarily only words and, and speeches, but love is about action. Love is about living in a way that we give to others, that we see people's needs and then meet them. When we help our brothers or sisters or siblings, that is the way that we show God's love to them, right? And then as we, uh, as we do this, it says that we experience the presence of God as well. Our faith in God and our love for others leads us to, to necessarily develop an ethic of, of service and action and uh, to work towards justice. In verse 23, it says, And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Emily and I talk a lot about sort of the, the state of the church, right, or the United Methodist Church specifically, and we, we often kind of come back to, our, why do we overcomplicate it so much, right? It, it's simple. We, we, we're called to, commanded really to, Believe in the name of Jesus Christ and to love others. It's that simple. And I just I think about how often we, we overcomplicate things with theological debates and get angry about our political ideologies about certain things when our focus ought to be on what unites us, right? Our love for Jesus Christ, our belief in Jesus Christ and on others and how we are called to love them and, and how to do that well. When we believe in God and love one another, we experience God's spirit. 
This is the way that the, uh, the belief becomes real in our lives. When we believe in God and love others through word and action, we bring the presence of God, the spirit of God with us into those situations. And I think it's important to note that it, it's probably already there too, right? And we may experience it from where we're sent as well as bringing it with us. Love challenges us to act. It calls us to be transformed by God's spirit and to live sacrificially, right? This is the part where we're maybe having to uh, metaphorically give up our lives, right? Give up uh, some part of who we are. Maybe that's our money or our time or our ideologies or, or our thoughts, our focus, our energy, right? We have to give of our very selves in order to, to follow uh, this command to believe in God and to love others. So when I was uh, growing up, the the official slogan for the United Methodist Church was open hearts, open minds, open doors. I think that's still the slogan or that's the de facto slogan. Um, and, and maybe maybe I was naive. I, I liked going to church as a kid, but I believed that, right? I took it seriously. I believe that's who we were as United Methodists. And I tried to live that out. And, and the church I grew up in tried to instill that in, in us as children and youth. Um, I imagine that's, that's also similar for here, right? That that was, that that was, uh, that was true to who we are as, as Glendale Heights. But I say I was maybe naive uh, because I've seen a lot of examples about how our doors are closed and our minds are closed and our hearts are closed, right? And and so the question, how can God's love abide in, in people who see needs of others and refuse to act? Well, we might be able to, to ask the same question. How can God's love abide in a church that has closed doors and closed hearts and closed minds? I want to share two examples of, of churches, not United Methodist churches, that have opened their doors and, uh, and have become a witness to the love that the church can show when they act and, and meet the needs of, of different people. They're both uh, similar stories about churches sort of becoming uh, sanctuaries for different folks at different times. So there was uh, a Dutch church, um, you may have seen this in the news, that held a 2,300 hour long service, seven days a week around the clock for 2,300 hours. And they did this uh, to help migrant families um, who were at risk of being deported. Similarly, in a Wall Street Journal story from a few years back, uh, a church in Minnesota kind of picked up the same, the same call. Then they made the, the decision to open their church to immigrants um, who, who were here illegally. Um, their pastor said the decision wasn't an easy one. He said that the church wanted to be smart about their decision, so they researched for eight or nine months, sought legal advice, and studied the history of sanctuary movements. Uh, they called this, this movement that they did sacred resisting. The church eventually took in four people uh, in this Minnesota church uh, who had applied for asylum in the U.S. and began providing material support for them. The families lived on the property of the church and did not leave the church for 750 days. So I want you to think about spending 750 days uh, inside there. The article reminds us that churches have long served as places of refuge, from sheltering escaped slaves as part of the Underground Railroad to providing safe havens for Central Americans fleeing conflict, and they've often done so with, with little to no interference from the, from the government. In 2011, religious institutions were deemed as sensitive locations with protections from immigration enforcement, and still not every church has embraced this, and the pastor says there are, of course, going to be folks who are going to say this is plain wrong, others who see this as decidedly too political or too radical. I just use these situations as examples. Uh, this isn't a sermon about how our church needs to do this. I just use this as an example of, uh, of what the church is called to be, right? And, and I think that at its core, the church is called to be a sanctuary, to be a place for people who are 
tired and weary and going through situations that are out of their control where they're struggling. God's love abiding within us calls us to surround people with love no matter what, right? No matter where people come from, where they've been, who they love, whether they're rich or poor, whether they are undocumented or homeless, God's love calls us to surround people with love no matter what. So like I mentioned, the the Pulse nightclub was five minutes away from uh, the church where Emily was serving, church I grew up in. Uh, It was about 10 minutes away from where I grew up uh, and where I was living. When I lived in Orlando, I would drive by the now um, uh, memorial every day on the way into the church where, where we worked. There was also a, a vigil at our DPAC, our uh, Dr. Phillips Performing Arts Center, um, which was right next to our church, really. I mean, it was the, the front of our church, if you looked out like this, looked at the green space where the vigil for the, the Pulse uh, vigil was. When the city called different churches to see if any churches would ring their bell, uh, no church answered except for First United Methodist Church of Orlando. And so during the vigil, uh, the church rang the bell 49 times for each person who uh, was killed in the Pulse uh, nightclub um, shooting. God challenged First United Methodist Church to act, right? God called uh, First United Methodist Church to love, uh, to love their neighbors, And the church did this in a big way through having ecumenical services, providing space for funerals and water to folks at the vigil, as well as providing a safe place for those who uh, were part of the LGBTQ community in Orlando. And afterwards, people at the church got mad. People at the church, some people left. People had theological debates about inclusion and affirming LGBTQ people into the life of the church. And some of those folks probably support the split that's most likely going to occur uh, coming up here whenever we can have a general conference. But I want you to know what else happened because of that. Because of that, people were loved and supported. Because of that, people, the church answered the call to become a sanctuary. God's presence was felt not just by people from that community, but also for people in the church and the Holy Spirit moved. This is just another example. Christians are sent into the world in the name of Jesus Christ to be the presence of God's love, not the ones fueling fear and hate towards others, not the ones closing the doors and excluding people. Whatever our situation here in in our community, whoever our neighbors are, we're called to love them. We're called to... uh, not first jump into a theological debate or a a political uh, discussion about everyone's um, different different understandings or or interpretations. We aren't called to become closed off or apathetic. We aren't called to ignore the world. We're called to love the world because we're all children of God living in this world. And and as children of God, we're made in God's image and, and each of us are deeply loved. We're also called uh, by God to practice an ethic of loving our neighbors through action, which I think through our action, uh, we honor the image of God in every person that we encounter. So frankly, uh, this morning, uh, I, you know, like I said, this isn't specifics of what I'm, I guess, suggesting or who I think our neighbors are or what we need to do. and, and I'm not as interested in, in what you believe or how you interpret the Bible or, or where you're, who you voted for. Um, we all believe in Jesus. Amen. And so that, that is what unites us. And I think it's important to focus on what unites us. And sometimes believing in Jesus calls us into the messy and uh, confusing and chaotic sacrificial work that Jesus did and modeled for us. Sometimes loving our neighbors uh, is very difficult and requires uh, us giving of ourselves, living sacrificially. It might 
even call us to, to give up our lives uh, in, in pursuit of, of doing that. That's what love is. Uh, and we love others through our actions, through our service, and through our witness. And uh, like, like the familiar song says, they will know we are Christians by our love. So will you pray with me? God, we ask uh, simply this morning that you would open our hearts, our minds, and our doors to the opportunities uh, around us to show Christian love to our neighbors. Amen. Now, if you'll join me in affirming our faith together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified dead and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's sing our second hymn, Jesus Calls Us. Thank everyone uh, for being here in worship together. Thank you everyone for, for viewing online with us this morning. Um, and so this morning as, as we're sent out, uh, remember to think about who your neighbors are and, and, and what you might be able to do uh, to meet, meet somebody else's need this week. Um, and by doing that, I, I pray that you would experience the, the, the love of God in your own life um, and that we might all encounter the ways the Spirit's working here in our community. So hear this benediction, and if you know it, you can say it with me. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve.